uh, today I'll be speaking on history and examination, which is the first basic thing for a PG when he is met with a case of a shoulder uh, during the exam. So if you look at the shoulder, it is a complex joint, including humerus, glenoid, scapula, clavicle, and the soft tissue around. So we should not forget the soft tissue uh, because they form the integral part of the shoulder joint. Now, when you're taking the history, the usual history, uh, which is to be taken in any other case, uh, I'm not going to go through, but some of the points in history that are relevant for shoulder, I'll pick it up here, like age. Now, once you have the age of the patient, you start thinking, your thinking process should start that if the patient is less than 30 years of age, they are more likely to be encountering traumatic problems, instability more. And if somebody has 45, age 45 plus, so we are going to look at more rotator cuff, frozen shoulder, and maybe 55 plus degenerative osteoarthritic conditions could be the cause. So the moment you have the age, you start thinking what could be the probable cause of the problem. Then also dominant hand, if it is involved, obviously is much more problematic to the patient. And also taking the work and sports history is important to understand how much the problem is affecting in day-to-day -day life of the person because this will help us to formulate the treatment for him at a later time. And coming to the uh, presenting complaints, the chief complaints. The chief complaints that uh, we see the patient in our, in our centers and our clinics are pain, swelling, clicking, weakness, stiffness, instability, of which pain is the most common thing. And it's almost associated with every other pathology like uh, like uh, swelling or stiffness or instability. So pain is uh, is what we'll deal in more depth. So when we have uh, um, the uh, pain uh, um, in shoulder, then we have to uh, start thinking in the back of our mind uh, that whether the pain is coming from the uh, shoulder itself or it is coming from somewhere else, what we call as a referred pain. So uh, there you can see the causes of pain uh, keep coming from the neck, elbow, wrist, diaphragm, cardiac, and sometimes vascular. So you have to exclude them while you're doing your uh, exam and your uh, history, so from history to the exam. And if it is arising from the shoulder proper, then it could be non-traumatic cause, traumatic or others. In others, you have to keep in mind in the back of the mind, it could be an entrapped nerve, it could be six scapular syndrome, could be scapular dyskinesia, uh, osteonecrosis of the head of the humerus. In traumatic, it could be acute or chronic. Again, it could be soft tissue or bony. So all these things have to be kept in the back of the mind and we have to exclude one or the other during our history and examination. Non-traumatic can be further classified into inflammatory, infective, metabolic, malignancy, degenerative, and the reasons of those are mentioned here. So uh, this we'll have to try and uh, segregate while we are doing our uh, history. So what is important first and foremost is history of trauma. The moment we ask history of trauma, then we ascertain is the trauma significant? If it's so, then it could be a traumatic pathology to soft tissue or bone. So we start thinking in those terms. Then the second common thing to find out is site of pain. Because as you see, as in the picture also, the moment the site of pain is at the anterior, uh, slightly lateral and superior aspect of the arm, this is where the patient generally uh, uh, holds when uh, there is a problem in shoulder, especially we have to start thinking in terms of rotator cuff uh, issues. But if the pain was more anterior and coming down towards the front of the arm to the elbow, then we are looking possibly towards the biceps pathology, bicep tendonitis and all those. But at the same time, if you see that the pain is in the top of the shoulder, then it is the AC joint area. So it could give us an idea that it is coming from AC joint. So our further history and further examination will go in that direction. Then the type of pain, is it a dull continuous pain or is it a sharp sudden pain? The dull continuous pain could be rotator cuff pathology, degenerative changes, sudden sharp pain could be traumatic uh, especially after this history of trauma, it could be liberal tear, it could be slap tear, things like that. Or is there a tingling sensation, patient complains, and especially if there's radiation, then it is pointing towards the nerve uh, pathology that we have to look at. Also, the severity of pain can sometimes give us an idea. We know that 
sudden severe pain is a common infl inflammatory pathology like uh, supraspinatus calcific tendonitis which is the you know very painful condition where patient is neither able to sit or stand and is in problem so severity also gives us an idea of which side uh, we have to think about which pathology which particular part of the shoulder could be uh, giving rise to the patient's problem then onset and duration of pain so how did it start? As I said, was it after trauma? Then it's traumatic. If it's a gradual, deciduous uh, onset and a long duration, then we are looking at rotator cuff, maybe frozen shoulder, uh, rotator cuff pathology. Or if it is um, uh, pain at night, uh, then it is more thinking in terms of it could be rotator cuff or it could be osteonecrosis. So this also gives us an idea which way we have to go. Radiation we talked about, if there's radiation, then we have to look at the neck and the other neurological disorders, which could have caused the nerve-related issues. Then the important thing is aggravating relieving factor as to when the pain becomes uh, worse. So if the patient has pain in abduction of at about 90 to 100 degrees, we know it is because of impingement, possibly rotator cuff tendonitis, which is the cause of problem. But the same pain is at 140 or 160 degrees uh, range, then we are looking at ACJ pathology. So uh, the, the uh, aggravating uh, points can give us the cause of pain. Abduction external rotation possibly could be an instability causing pain. So uh, we get an idea from uh, this as to what pathology and where we are dealing with. Then lastly, we also need to know the progress of the pain. When it started, as it get, it is getting progressively worse, but it's getting better. It's getting better, that means the pathology is settling down. It's getting worse, that means something is ongoing process. So that also helps us in our thinking process. Similarly for swelling, all those headings we have to also revise in swelling. How did it start, the course, whether it is associated with stiffness, whether there is fever uh, associated, is there slightest movement causing a problem along with swelling, then we think of infective pathology. It's associated with pain, slightest movement causing a lot of pain to the, uh, to the uh, patient. Uh, it is bacterial infection could be a, uh, one uh, uh, differential diagnosis. But if it is insidious onset with low grade fever, some loss of weight, we know that this is, uh, in, in, uh, it could be towards tubercular pathology or a chronic pathology. Inflammatory pathology present with pain but not so much of fever, which may be moderate amount. So that also we have to factor in as well as the metabolic causes of swelling. If there is a swelling, needless to say that we also have to do, if there's a localized swelling, the other uh, examination of swelling, which is usual site, size, shape, surface, margin, consistency. So all those things have to be also done if we find swelling, which is localized in and around the shoulder. Then looking at the stiffness, Again, uh, how did the stiffness start? The onset, duration, history of trauma. If there is no history of trauma, onset is slow and insidious, then again, we know we are looking at rotator cuff or frozen shoulder kind of a problem. But if there is a history of uh, injury and uh, an acute onset, then uh, we know it's a traumatic cause, most probably rotator cuff, uh, which is causing the issue or any other bony pathology. So same kind of uh, uh, questioning, leading questions have to be asked here. Clicking is another complaint. Now, clicking, again, with the history of injury and sharp sudden click or catch in the shoulder would uh, actually point towards a labral tear, which is giving it. At the same time, if there is a gradual, uh, slow growing pain, and uh, uh, along with clicking at the back of the shoulder, uh, we know that it could be a snapping scapula could be doing it. So it gives us an idea which side to look at. Micro instability sometimes causes clicking uh, with no history of injury. So that also has to be kept in mind. We have to have high suspicion of um, uh, while we are looking at clicking or all these things. Then the patient may present with a frank instability. And this is more likely for uh, postgraduates to come across because we see quite often in most of the uh, clinics instability and more than often they are picked up for uh, you know, exam because they give a good history. There's a lot of things to see. So when there's history of in, uh, instability, the patient has come, it could be weakness and pain to complete frank dislocation. Here, history of trauma becomes very important. 
because we know if there is a significant history of trauma, then we classify that as stable into traumatic. If there is no history or there is mild history of trauma, it could be a traumatic instability. And in instability, the index dislocation history is very important. When did it happen first, obviously? And how did it happen? Was it a significant trauma? Did you go to the hospital to get it reduced? It shows that there was definitely a dislocation. And how many dislocations since then is also important to us. It gives you an idea of what kind of a pathology we will see in, you know, there will be a, a labral tear, but what will be the level of uh, tissue if it is 10, 15, 20 dislocations, we know the quality of labral will be very poor and also we may encounter the bony erosions also. So we need to investigate in those terms should somebody have 20 dislocations plus. Similarly, the position of discomfort as to what position does the shoulder uh, cause problem to the patient. So typically we know the commonest instability is anterior and in this place, the patient has problem in abduction, external rotation, overhead, like the badminton, or sleeping with the arm uh, behind the head. So that's when it becomes uncomfortable. So that's anterior instability possibly. But at the same time, if the patient complains of pain when they're trying to reach in front and towards the uh, uh, left side of the body or across the body, and it points out toward the posterior labrum uh, pathology. And if the patient has problem holding anything heavy while like a suitcase or, or, or something heavy by the side of the body, then they could point towards the inferior labral pathology. So those uh, things give us an idea what kind of instability we are looking at. And if the instability is there, then we also need to know, is there the same problem in the other joint? Is there a history of hyperlaxity and they're able to do some tricks that they've been showing their friends and uh, being uh, able to do some uh, you know, crazy things with their body. So that would show hyperlaxity, if at all. Then the patient may present as weakness. A weakness, as I said, could also be a sign of instability. But if you look at weakness, then we are looking at more of uh, the first thing that comes to mind. If there's a history of injury and following which there's a weakness, then we are looking at a rotator cuff pathology, rotator cuff tear, which uh, there's a typical history, the click, and since then the patient is not able to lift the arm up. But if there is no history of trauma and there are some signs of radiation or some uh, tingling, then a neurological uh, pathology should also be kept in mind. And if we think so, then we do a complete neurological examination. This leading, uh, with this uh, presenting complaints, we ask certain leading questions, find out how all these problems are affecting his life. Is work at work, home, work, sports, how is it affected? So understand how much problem the patient is having. Also, the past uh, treatment history, non-operative, operative, what he's already had, that will help us to plan further. Past medical history, uh, diabetes, uh, you know, hyperlaxity or any other medical problem, family history, especially ligamentum laxity and diabetes mellitus. Now with this in uh, place, we have already uh, stratified our causes of problem into, and hopefully we would have come down to four or five probable causes of the problem of the patient. Now from here, we go to the examination of the shoulder. Now here we'll try to narrow down to one or two causes uh, which are the cause of the problem um, um, uh, of the patient. So exam, just like any other part, goes into look, feel, move, and special test. Same, uh, 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 this thing is used. So we start with uh, look, which is also called inspection, and that start as soon as the patient walks into the clinic. How is he holding his upper limb? How is he load holding his body? So that gives us some idea. Obviously, good history, and then a proper exposure for shoulder is required. The proper shoulder for uh, shoulder examination, the exposure is from umbilicus above, the body of the patient should be bare so that we can see both sides of the shoulder, front and the back and the neck. And uh, for the, obviously for the female patient, we need a lady chaperone who would do the needful cover for us to be able to do the shoulder exam. Then if this male patient, just observe him, how does he remove his shirt? also gives you a clue about pathology that we are dealing with. And then the inspection goes without saying from the front, side, back, and do not miss from the top. There is one or two things that you can pick up from the top which uh, can be of importance. So in inspection, what are the look, what we are trying to look at is the uh, level of the shoulder and the deformity. We look at the skin. 
for any scar marks on the skin, which will tell us what has happened in the past. Sinuses, uh, obviously, will tell us infective pathology and wasting of muscle and any other positive thing that we can see um, uh, has to be noted down and compared to the other side to understand what is normal for the patient. From the front, we can see the sternum, the clavicle, the AC joint, shoulder for deformity, sulcus, any other wasting uh, uh, of uh, muscles, deltoid, pectoral, bicep, scalene. From the side, the same thing is again um, uh, inspected and we look at the deltoid, we look at the scapula from the profile, eye riding scapula, winging of scapula can be seen uh, here also. And then we look at the pectoral is major in profile in the front and the neck for any other pathology of the neck uh, that can be seen better on the side view. Once looking for the back, we reconfirm the shoulder level, which we had thought once we had seen in the front, we reconfirm. We look at the scapula for any abnormality and wasting of infraspinatus is seen well from back along with the parascapular and paraspinal muscles. And from the top, you can see the supraspinatus mainly and any wasting of supraspinatus, which is very often uh, there, uh, can be well appreciated from the top. As we have seen, then we go down to feeling that is palpation, have a routine. Could be any, anybody can uh, 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 formulate their own routine. This is just one example of a routine that we follow, start from the spine of the scapula. So we start walking from the spine of the scapula, walk on to the acromion, ACJ, clavicle, ending up at sternum. Any pathology found anywhere, tenderness, then we dwell more into it. Otherwise, we go a low level below at some microbial space. Any tenderness, anterior lateral in subacromial space could be protective cuff uh, related, which will give us an idea. Feeling the bony structures there, lesser tuberosity, greater tuberosity uh, groove could give us an idea of uh, bicipital uh, tendinitis and the coracoid process is to be felt for any pathology. Then the muscular and soft tissue tenderness. Along with that, the other finding of, as I said earlier, also swelling, scar, sinus has to be examined exactly how we would do in any general surgery or any other uh, place. Not forget to look for sensory uh, examination of the badge area because very often some of the shoulder pathology are having association uh, and if it is missed, it may be, uh, you know, so who do uh, your badge area, put your hand and compare to the other side. And if there is any problem of sensory and you've been thinking in the, um, from the history, then go ahead and do the um, uh, dermatological, uh, the uh, neurological examination, derm dermatomes and myotomes to be all checked. Then look at the movement in all the planes, forward flexion, extension, internal and external rotation by the side of the arm, by the side of the body. And arm at 90 degree flexion, internal and internal rotation will tell you about the capsular stiffness, GERD and all those things can be picked up there and then abduction, adduction. And both active and passive have to be taken because they give you a lot of information about the pathology. We've already talked, if there is a pain and restriction of movement during abduction at 90 to 100 degrees, we are looking at impingement. And if the same thing is at 150 degrees, then 160 degrees when we're looking at AC joint. If the active movement is much less and passive is much more, then we are looking at possibly rotator cuff tear so there we have, um, uh, when we have a tear in rotator cuff, patient is actively not able to abduct or forward flex as compared passively, he or she may have full range of movement. So that gives us an idea about if active and passive is equal, likelihood is uh, either if it is frozen shoulder or some other traumatic pathology. So this gives important information for, um, for us to go further. Then we come down to muscle power testing. Again, individual muscles have to be tested. There are two groups of muscle, the local uh, rotator cuff muscle and the global muscle. So in the rotator cuff, we look at supraspinatus, which is done uh, in this fashion, which is also called empty can test. Patient abducts uh, the arm with complete internal rotation in this plane of the scapula and the examiner tries to resist that uh, uh, at movement, and if there is a pain, it signifies tendinitis. If there's a weakness, then it signifies loss of power. Then similarly, in infraspinatus, ISP is done, arm by the side, and uh, um, external rotation is done with the flexed elbow, and resistance is placed by the uh, examiner. If there is pain or weakness, that's what we're looking for. 
similarly for the teres minor we uh, we abduct the arm 90 degrees elbow flex 90 and then the patient puts the arm back that is external rotation resisted by the examiner and if it causes pain or weakness then uh, it is positive that is the uh, three muscles then the left is subscap now in subscap we have uh, various many tests this is for some reason gone on its own this is the belly press test but uh, uh, that you can do but what we do recommend the first test to do is the gerber's test which is the test wherein the patient's arm is internally rotated with the hand in the lumbar area as you see there and then the patient tries to lift the arm off the back while the uh, examiner is trying to resist any pain or weakness is uh, what uh, one is looking for we already saw the belly press test in the front and there is another one bear hugger but you uh, if you have only one test gerber test you can do well that's good but this is the bear hugger test where you put the arm the hand on the other shoulder and the examiner tries to bring that palm off from the shoulder with the elbow and uh, uh, the wrist straight and patient complaining pain or loss of uh, uh, power is uh, what we are interested in. Then, uh, then we look at the other muscles. Pack major is when the patient actually presses into the iliac crest with both uh, the uh, wrist at, and hand on the iliac crest. You feel for the anterior fold of uh, um, axilla showing the pect major uh, uh, muscle. Biceps can be tested by speed test or Jagerson. In speed test, you keep the elbow straight and the arm is forward flexed and the um, examiner resisting the arm movement and any pain or weakness is what we are looking at. The Jagerson test is done in this fashion. You flex the elbow to 90 degrees and the patient is trying to supinate while the uh, examiner is trying to resist. So any pain or weakness uh, is uh, showing a positive test. Biceps is forceful extension of the elbow uh, against resistance, uh, can, can test the triceps, and an ab abduction of the arm against resistance gives the deltoid uh, uh, muscle. Then we look at some special tests for impingement from the history and examination. If we are thinking about uh, um, uh, impingement, then we do certain specific tests. We have already done the painful arc. We have done the power of uh, muscles. Then we do certain specific tests, Hawkins test for impingement. Here, the patient uh, is standing in front of the, of the examiner. The patient's arm is forward flexed 90 degrees and the elbow flexed to 90. And then maintaining the arm at the same level, the examiner internally rotates, bringing the greater tuberosity under the acromion and rubbing the origin of the uh, rotator cuff. And if there is any swelling or pain, the patient will complain of uh, pain if there is any tendinitis. Similarly, the nearest test can be done here in the arm uh, is internally rotated and in the uh, forward direction, it is lifted up all the way till about 170, 180 degrees. If there is pain at 90 degrees, that is uh, uh, rotator cuff tendinitis. And if it is 160, 70, it is AC joint. Then we also repeat the same test, supinating the arm. And if the pain goes away at 90 degrees, that shows that it is a mild tendinitis of rotator cuff. But AC joint pain will still persist even if you keep the palm supinate. So that gives us the information about uh, rotator cuff. Then in instability, we need to find out what kind of instability it is and also confirm. As I said, 90% of time you will come across anterior instability. So we should be able to examine it quite nicely. So the apprehension test could be done in a standing position or lying down. So in standing position, this is how it is done. The examiner stands behind the patient. The patient's arm is abducted 90 degree plus and the elbow is flexed uh, 90 degrees. And then an external rotation force is given. And if the patient winces or uh, resists your movement, that shows that there is a forward push of the head of the humerus into the bankart lesion, which patient tries to resist as positive test. Sometimes patient is having a lot of pain and apprehension sometimes leads to actual dislocation in the clinic. And if we want to avoid, then we can do a test which can give the same information, giving less pain to the patient that is 
Job 3 location test. This is done with the patient lying on the bed. As you see here, the patient is lying on the bed, shoulder is at the edge of the table, and what we do again, the same thing. We abduct the shoulder to 90 degree plus, and then elbow 90 degree flexion, and then external rotation is done, and there's a hand in front of the humerus, which is holding the humerus in. For a second, we lift the hand up, and the, the, the humerus moves forward. Patient has an apprehension, as you saw, and then you put the hand back to re-stabilize the shoulder so that the patient doesn't have a complete dislocation or serious pain, but you have got your information from that, and there is an unstable shoulder and anterior instability is there. If you have instability, then you also need to look at humerus translation. This generally we do under GA, which gives a better information, but even in an active uh, patient, you can do. So you hold and stabilize the scapula, and then with the other hand, hold and stabilize the humerus, and then move the humerus forward and backward relative to, uh, to scapula and see how much it moves. If it moves more than two quadrant, then it is uh, lax, and if it's more than three quadrant, then it is almost unstable. So that gives us the humeral glide or humeral translation information. Then for posterior dislocation, we, uh, we uh, test the patient uh, sitting or standing as we've seen in both the forearm. The arm is forward flex and adducted and an axial force is applied on the humerus stabilizing the back and this puts the stresses on the posterior capsule and labrum and if there is pain then uh, obviously it confirms the posterior labral pathology. And for the inferior uh, labral pathology, we do the Fegan's test. Here, as you can see, the patient's arm is put on the uh, examiner's shoulder, elbow straight, and at that stage, uh, you put the downward force in the mid-arm region like this, and if there is any pathology here, uh, inferiorly, the patient will complain of pain and uh, uh, the information is received. Then if the multi-direction, you would see a sulcus sign, you will be able to insinuate your finger under the acromion easily, and you pull the humeral, humerus of the arm down, and you can see those two dimples, as you see, this is a typical sulcus sign, uh, sign of multi-direction instability. If you are faced with a situation, or in case of any instability, it's, uh, it is always a victim that you look for hyperlaxity uh, by doing a beta score. And if you have a rotator cuff pathology, then you do the uh, test for rotator cuff muscles and you will get the, uh, get the idea uh, about the power. But sometimes if it is there, this is what is called the drop arm test. The patient tries to lift the arm up and they use a trick as she was able to do. And when you ask them to bring it down, they will again do a trick and then use the other arm support. So this is a typical drop arm test positive for a patient with rotator cuff tear. Uh, then for AC joint, again, you do cross adduction test where the arm is uh, forward flex and adducted and an axial force is applied. And as you adduct more and more elbow, a pain on the shoulder top is uh, signifying ACJ involvement. Last slide to come, don't forget the scapula. Look from the back for scapular rhythm. So ask the patient to forward flex the arm from the zero degrees and in abduction also, and look for the movement of the scapula. There may be an abnormal movement or there may be a winging of scapula. So this gives you an idea that something is happening at the back and uh, that can be factored in when we are trying to understand uh, what is going on and trying to come down to the pathology which is cause of the problem of the patient. So with this, we come down to the end of history and examination, which we have tried to cover all which is basic. There are many tests described, but the commonest test and commonest thing that you should know and should at least have information uh, we have tried to convey. I wish all the very best to all. Thank you for the patient hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prateek.